Five panellists, five topical issues, no holds barred. For me, it's not knowledge that's lacking. It's that greed, it's that mentality where you feel you deserve to take your own and take it infinitely and let everybody else just manage however they will manage. We're almost becoming hardwired to try and cheat. I would, you know, suggest that we begin to hold our leaders accountable. There was a time in this country when yes. things actually work. I don't think that any organization should be above the law. And I think one of the challenges we have in this country is about governance across the board. Well, well, what I'm saying is that it doesn't really affect us in Nigeria. I don't know what we can do if the system is already corrupted. We've been warned as a continent of the influx of the Chinese. If you don't repay your debt, they will just colonize you. Hi, long time no see. You're welcome to The Advocate on PLUS TV Africa, where five of us discuss five thought-provoking topics in an atmosphere of seriousness, decisiveness, and a little bit of laughter. However, we do not mince words, and like we say, no holds bad. Today, I'll be speaking about the status quo of the Nigerian leadership and the constant fight for hope as a Nigerian. Balan is warning traders who blocked food supply, warning their Warning them that Egungu to be careful. Liberos is advocating deeply on the importance of good governance, while Chuka is asking all Nigerians to condemn both old and new governments. So we have a new, so that we can have a new Nigeria. And finally, Jumoke, well, first let me say good to meet you, finally, <laughs> and happy birthday. Thank you. So Jumoke is posing a question as she asks Who is Nigeria's next Messiah? So please stay with us, and we'll be right back. Leadership, hope, and the status quo. Well, first let me say that it's great to be back on The Advocate after a long hiatus. Um, now that I'm back, living in Nigeria today takes a special brew of courage, resourcefulness, a little bit of apathy, but plenty spoonfuls of craziness. Indeed, I'm tired assailed, fatigued by the daily dose of misery and death. I mean, it's, it's a bit like living in a real Mad Max movie set. Yet people like Liberus, he gives me courage, he gives me hope. He keeps talking, challenging the status quo, fighting in the hope that somehow, someday, Nigeria can become great again. It is possible that we may yet pull this nation out of the dark from the abyss. I hope so, for the sake of our children. However, Nigeria is presently constituted and governed stuff. That would require something that even the current political class seem to be greatly deficient in. Which brings me to the main issue that I want to table today. The remarkable absence of hope. The narrative of hope that's missing in all the discourse on the vision for a better Nigeria. It is the business and the trademark indeed, I, I will say, of politicians all over the world to sell to their people a picture of hope and a vision of a better future. I might even add that it is the responsibility of leaders to sell hope. However, when listening to the current crop of political leaders lately, all I hear is the raucous noises of cows, death, doom, and despair. And then I've said this before on this platform that I think it bears repeating that any country that fails to present a vision of a better country and instead fashions weapons of war against its young persons clearly has no future. Elected leaders must do their jobs, not only to provide security and welfare, but also to present clear visions of hope and inclusive progress for all citizens and residents. If you listen to the leaders of Dubai, Sheikh Al Maktoum, James talk, you hear about his grand plans for, for his country and the people in terms of the direction where they're going. If you, if you hacking back, you know, 50 years in here, President J the late Kennedy talked about America in the 60s, he painted a vision of, of great American progress, of exceptionalism in science and manufacturing. You don't see good leaders blaming ghosts from the past. In Nigeria, we're consumed instead by talks of cows and herders, which are indeed relics of a past which we, you know, stubbornly hold on to. Same way our politicians who are used to funding adulation of supporters and are not used to any sort of criticisms. So any, any attempt to criticize them, they'll consider it disrespect, and in fact, they'll say they label you a hater, and some may even go as far as uh, labeling your, your criticism as hate speech. 
That's the world we live in now. So what vision of Nigeria do we hope to present to this new generation of young people who are not accustomed to the old ways, the old ways of the oversensitive generation, people who have been nurtured by the internet, yet assaulted by the failures of their own state, people who are accustomed to the ways of decent societies, yet they're living in uh, the stark reality of sc pervasive scarcity and the abundance of opportunities that the world presents. So you can imagine how frustrated some of these young people can be, willing to work hard, yet the opportunities are far in between. Some, indeed, they're told to keep quiet, and be more respectful, and wait for your turn. Wait for your turn in the raging sea of despair. And sadly, if we go back to the NSAS protests, which took place last October, when millions of young people filled the streets to peacefully protest, calling for an end to police brutality, what they got in return were not words of, of vision of a more just society. Instead, they got even more brutality. And indeed, more threats and actions continue. That tells young persons in no uncertain terms that the vision of a country, a better country they yearn for, is lost. And instead, they should settle for a status quo of injustice and suffering. On October 20th, 2020, that day broke my heart. It broke me in many pieces. It took something from me. Something that I doubt I can ever find again. I lost hope. Ah, uh, if people like you would say that they lost hope, I wonder what um, you know the everyday everyday Nigerian would um, would, would say. Uh, because really, um, I agree with you everything you have said, and there's really nothing to look forward to in terms of hope. But we just can't lose hope. We have to keep hoping. Oh, wow. And for me, in most cases, I think we are the ones that will have to sometime rise and say, you know what, we need to take it back and make it better. Because, like you said, if we keep waiting for them to make it better, it's, it's, it's we'll lose happen. hope, Taya. Well, we try to paint a picture of how it ought to be. And I try very hard not to compare Nigeria with any other country, be it Western or African country, because we're a continent of our own with over 400 ethnicities. But what is a democracy? Is a government of all of us for all of us. So when we try to paint that picture, like you mentioned in your advocacy, they call you a hater because some few people are paid to not see everything that is going wrong. So you're the one person who is pointing it out. To say, you cannot compare human life to the life of a cow. They say you're a hater. <laughs> I'm flabbergasted. Um, October 20 um, was a very sad day in the annals of Nigeria's history. But, but for me, um, along with every other thing that we need to do about the incident of that day, one other thing we must not fail to do is to get more participatory in the process. I have asked myself, the protest, the, the, the police that was at the center of that uh, uh, protest, has it been reformed? Not has yet. anything changed? Not yet, sir. Absolutely nothing has changed. The police remains brutal. They continue to do the same thing they were doing before that time. Chuka. So can we just get more participatory in the process, including this generation? Can we hijack even the, the, the parties, if it is possible? Chuka. You know. but, but really, I'm maniacally, I mean, I'm maniacally bewildered. <laughs> uh, seriously, that uh, anybody would think that government would do it differently you know, during that protest. True. So, Chuka. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, the government, as we know it, um, is hell-bent on blocking any attempt to modernize the country. So I think that, you know, the only the way we could, I don't know, the way we could make, bring back hope for someone like Emeka um, involves quite a lot. I mean, it's something that's close to... And somebody what like I, you too, you know, because... Uh, to talk about. <laughs> <later>. Run away. <laughs> <laughs> Did you hear... <laughs> I said we need to bring hope back to people like you too because you've run away. <laughs> oh, no, no, no. I am very, I am in Nigeria in spirit. And I shall be back shortly. Carry on. <laughs> but Rebecca is here in Fisica, but he has moved to Europe in, in spirit. spirit. <laughs> As a matter of fact, 
it is the failure of Nigeria that is the reason I am here mm. for True. a few months Obviously. of this year. Mm. If it wasn't for the failure of the country, after 60 years of independence, I shouldn't be here at all. There's nothing much for me to have been here if everything was working fine. Yeah. So I think it all sort of ties in with what Emeka is saying. Where is the hope? What's going to change? How is it going to change, you know? Well, um, you know, just to round off, I, I, I believe that, as I said in that piece, that um, political leaders, in as much as we're grappling with all the challenges, cows, herders, and all the difficulties, I think they should also make an attempt to project a measure of hope, hope. Yeah, especially absolutely. to young people. Very, very. In your speeches, in the, in the things you do, yeah. and your actions, give hope yeah. to the people. And so, I've said my piece. Um, but after this break, uh, Golan is bringing out his egungun as he speaks on the food blockage from the north to the south. So please stay with us. Egungun, be careful. Egungun is a Yoruba word. Um, Oyinbos call it masquerade. They are supposedly spirits of the dead visiting the living. Since they are supposed to be spirits, egunguns wear a regalia. Yorubas call it eku. That shrouds the identity of the wearer. The egungu is accompanied by a guide called the atokun. And among other things, it is the role of the atokun to ensure that the egungu, having covered its eyes, does not fall into a ditch or any other accident situation. This informed the message of Egungu be careful, in which an Egungu was dancing onto the expressway, and the Atokun had to send out the warning. Egungu be careful, now nice express with the go. So, of course, Egungu is not a spirit after all, but a human being in the regalia. If he enters the expressway without looking out for vehicles, he will be dead meat. So when some associations chose to block foodstuff, from crossing over to the south because the federal government did not pay them compensation for losses incurred during the NSAS protest, the Egungu be careful message becomes instructive because in the real sense, the Egungu was dancing onto the expressway in full regalia. First, NSAS losses did not have ethnic coloration and there is absolutely no basis for a section of the society to think that the federal government should selectively pay them compensation. If anything, don't they know where the seat of the federal government is to go and make their demands? Secondly, who truly do these associations represent? Is it the northern farmer who has a truckload of tomato or pepper to sell? Certainly not. Someone said, but they threatened to take these items to Cameroon and other neighboring countries to sell. Yes, that is possible but it's still illogical. When a Cameroon market that used to receive one truckload of tomatoes daily suddenly receives four, what will happen to the price? So the idea of taking those produce to create gluts in neighboring countries also doesn't add up. Now watch. Another person said, oh, they just want to punish the South. But hey, a whole lot of Northerners here in the South are involved in the retail business of food items. So when you cut off supply, you not only punish Southerners, you're also punishing millions of Northerners whose livelihood depend on retailing these food items. That is to say, even this punishing South story does not make sense. It doesn't make sense that a Nigerian farmer or trader will choose to exclude itself from Lagos, the largest market with the highest effective demand in the entire sub-region, and then head for the desert to sell his produce because he feels that some people sitting in Abuja were winning. It defies logic. Dear associations, your economics must be very poor. And obviously, you are neither representing the farmer nor the traders. You are mere rent seekers. If this blockade lingers and the South chooses to replace you as a supply source, you may never recover that market. Remember. There is land, there is water, there is sunshine in the south. So let your egungu be careful, because na express you they go so. From the perspective of a hard-working northern farmer, or the trader who has bought truck 
loads of food stuff. The blockade doesn't make sense. So we must ask those associations in whose interest. I'll give you my thoughts. It is politicians and their greedy rent seeker friends that are playing games. And it was a dangerous game. However, as the truck was approaching this Egungu at high speed, somehow he heard the Atokun's voice and scampered off the expressway. Else, the consequences might have been well above what the little minds of the schemers could have contemplated. I hope the lessons of this event were taken. Ah, well taken, sir. Are you when sure? the ah, well taken, no bros. No. When the tomatoes no. that you used to sell no. for twelve thousand naira no. went to two thousand naira, no those one was still buying. Those are not the lessons for me. I must say, those are not the lessons. The lessons have not been taken. The lessons are, you know, when you sit down up north and think that um, you don't need the south, or that you sit down in the south and think you don't need the north. Now, with this, the lesson is that we need each other. True. And, and so this idea of we are better off than these other people, we should drop it. You decide not to sell to the south. And then also, let's not even deceive ourselves. With this, it is obvious that the North need the South even much more than the South need the North. I agree. That we can't hide it away from. I agree. Yes, the South is a supply market. The, like you said, if they decide to replace you, those Cameroon that you take your tomatoes to, some of them were complaining that they got there, they already had these stuffs. And, and so at the end of the day, some of them even ended up giving them away. Yes, I yes. heard they so gave them away. So some traders had to use flight to ferry their goods to the south, because they were not part of all of this. Yeah. Now they have graduated, they have called it off, yes. pretending to hold, hold a meeting. Like you said, it is the politicians. And I look at, I saw Yaya Bello, I don't want to call him another name, and Fanny Kai on the peace pretending to broker <laughs> peace, and I look at these clowns. Peace between who and who now? Which yeah. the, <laughs> the, <laughs> the headers, the tomato sellers, and the presidency. It's, it's <laughs> crazy. I, I think for me, um, the lesson or the sad part of this is just the narrative that we've gotten to the point where over the last four to five years, we've seen the schism, the, 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 the divide within Nigeria has grown. And you were talking within your piece of north, south. I mean, as I, was, as I said during the, before we got on, I grew up in the barracks. There's no north, north south. south, you know. Um, and I, I, I went to command school, you know, there's... It's only in the last couple of years we're beginning to see that divide, you know, widen. grow, widen, and become the edges. It's yeah. not just that they, 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 they've grown apart, but they've become sharp, hmm. yeah. and very sharp. And that's the problem where we have this narrative of north, south. But like Libero said, clearly we, we, we need each other. Um, mm -hmm. both, you know. But I, I think the sum of it for me is that it shows that we're a country of two parts. Obviously. And we're a country of two, two parts, at least. And we need to sit down again to, yeah. to have a conversation well, about yeah. how we, we, want, to, we yeah. want to come mm -hmm. together. True. True. And not just this force thing where we buy military fiat, by decrees and by constitution, True. which was foisted on us by, the, say, this is how we, you know, you hear people, politicians and government people say, um, it, 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 nothing is non-negotiable in Nigeria. I mean, <laughs> even Tuga. in the UK, had, they had referendums yes. and they yeah. had all kinds of things. You can't Tuga. say that. Oh, someone said that the UK that even amalgamated us, <laughs> they have now they Brexited. Have yes. Yeah. <laughs> so, Chuka. I think that um, the, 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 the North-South divide in Nigeria is, is really not a new thing. Because if I think back to when we were in secondary school, we were in Federal Government College Warri, which was the unity school. Truth is that I remember very carefully that during the elections for the vice secretary of our union, of, of the Students' Council, the winner almost always tended to be from the North because the Northern students voted on mass for the Northern candidates. And it was the only way a Southern boy could win that vice secretary was if he was able to key into the Northern votes, or there was no Northerner that year willing to come forward to compete. I remember it very, very clearly. And, mean, and meanwhile, 
when it, it didn't work the other way around because when a very brilliant chap called Ibrahim Hadou, Hadou went for it, out of a thousand votes, he got 900 and something because everybody voted for Bradu, for Ibrahim Hadou. Because he was and brilliant. So it, it, the South have been slow in being sectional, basically, is what I'm saying. Mm. And, the, you know, the North, it's like they teach them from a young age sectionalism. Mm. That's the problem. That's a problem we have. Yeah. Well, Liberos is next after the break, as it points out the importance of good governance. According to Frank Hubert, good governance never depends upon laws, but upon the personal qualities of those who govern. The important element of governance are followership and the leaders, emphasis mind though. Unfortunately, in Nigeria, the followers are no different from the leaders. Hence, I say, a country wanted. Research revealed that the 10 consistent skills of great leaders are integrity, ability to delegate, communication, like Emeka had talked about, self-awareness, gratitude, learning agility, influence, empathy, courage, and respect. Considering the above, who amongst our rulers can we truly call a leader in Nigeria? Starting from our local government to the state assembly, governors, national assembly, and even the president. By the time you find the answer, America or China, go don't go Neptune, come back. The reason good leadership in public sector across board has consistently eluded Nigeria like rain during Hamatan season is because we, the followers, are not different from those leading us. We only mount good leadership, but we do anything to undermine its actualization. Little wonder Professor Lumumba rightly posited that in Japan, a corrupt person kills himself. In China, the government will kill him. In Europe, they jail him. But in Africa, Dito Nigeria, he will present himself for election. And we have so many of them around us. Now you know why some people wonder when those we describe as leaders in Nigeria open their mouth to speak. If they are not negotiating with militants, they are, they've created it directly or indirectly. They are paying ransom to killers and bandits while the law-abiding citizens are victims are told to be sympathetic to the cause of their killers and tormentors. Unfortunately, the victims will condemn anyone that tries to liberate them and then celebrate the same rulers. And then you hear words like amiable governor, Mr. Wake and See governor, energetic governor, Mr. Fix It, Osho Quick, anti corrupt president, my people, my people governor. Very sad. See, as I shame, they catch me for Nigeria. Can you truly call Nigeria a nation with leaders in government or a contraption with scavengers feeding fat on their own destructions? With those being destroyed, waiting to destroy others. A country where you can be arrested for criticizing an absentee president, but compensated as a killer, kidnapper, militant, and fraudsters, while the victims are mocked and asked not to be coward, can become a country. A country where governors don't have the faintest idea about security of lives and properties, despite being chief security officers with huge sum as security vote, should bear any other name but a country. A country where senators beg the president to speak to them in time of crisis, where children are being kidnapped like chicken, with a deafening silence from the commander-in-chief, should know that it's being mocked when called a country. Where councillors only count and share location and local government chairmen can't even share nothing. State assembly members are assembled to genuflect before the emperor, who is the governor. They should go and ask Trump for another name. It shouldn't be called a country. A land where the government will take a loan, backed by sovereign guarantee for infrastructure from China. Yet government, in collaboration with the follower, will give out their in-country services jobs to the same Chinese to do, thereby taking the money back to China. Why the citizens are jobless, hungry, angry, and carrying arms against the state should be called a colony and not a country. A place where those waiting to steal from the system and more than those stealing already will need to break up to be able to make up. If you like, call it restructuring. We're on the same page. We have people who have the solution to the problem of the country everywhere. But during election, these same people will still queue up behind those that have consistently cheated, defrauded, and stolen from us, and in some cases, fighting one another 
to elect these same people as leaders. Yet we sit down in our comfort zone and take Jerry Rollins or Chief Ghani Fahemi, both of blessed memory, we come in shining armor to liberate us and lie with a lie. If we can't liberate ourselves, nobody will. I will therefore advocate that until we see election as our way of participating in government and choose our leaders based on their competence and content of their ideas rather than their religion, tribe, ethnicity, gender, or age, would we'll wake up one day and discover that we never had a country. If you like, run away to Europe and America, to Canada, thinking that the problem should be borne by those in Nigeria only. Don't be surprised when someday, after your sojourn, you have nowhere to call home, having acquiesced when you should have been consigned. Knowing that leadership shapes nation, community, and even organization, as followers, we should strive to hold our leaders accountable, always irrespective of their tribe or tongue. Not when it favors you, it becomes a blessing, but when it doesn't, it's corruption. Let not only perspire, but be consensual to acquire a country we will all admire. Be the country that you desire. Mm -hmm. Let Chuka tell us. Chuka. <laughs> well, um, Limbros, um, again, I can see your frustration, which has already been uh, shown by Emeka earlier, uh, in a country that isn't quite working like a country. So I, I quite like when you say we should ask Trump what name we should name ourselves now. I mean, he gave us shithole before. I don't know if there's anything else anybody else wants to give us. Um, but in the spirit of being kind to Nigeria, uh, because we are all Nigerians, um, it would be nice for us to still think that uh, we are just a country in despair. And, you know, let's still assume that we are a country and we can repair it. Mm. I, I, I was saying that, um, I, you know, um, one of the things I find about elections, you're speaking about elections and how more people should participate, and I think that is a major sub-theme sub of this, is the fact mm. that elections are never really about ideas. That's mm. true. In a climate where a lot of people are ignorant and uneducated. And even in, in very educated countries, we see what's happening in America and you, in the UK where people voted against their own interests, you know, uh, with the Brexit and so on. Elections, and I think that's how elections are now being fought. People have now realized that elections are all about emotions. It's how people feel. So even if someone is a thief or someone has been, you know, um, has gone through this, yeah, incompetent. But if I feel that he's my own, he's our own, or my brother, or my sister, or my kinsman. It doesn't, you know, you can speak all the grammar, saying this guy is incompetent, it doesn't, it doesn't matter. You know, so I, I think that it now goes back into the system and how political leaders are, sh are, are right. born, are shaped, either by the political parties to help to win, to win the process and say, this is, this is our best person. Mm. But unfortunately, we, we live in a country of compromise mm. that clearly, Sean's best practice, Sean's actually militantly says we don't want the best. Just give us the one that is okay. You know, and, and, and so that's where we are. So I, I find that, you know, um, that's why when I said in my own piece that... You, you lost hope. <laughs> um, no, because that, that incident, the way that it happened, not just that it happened, but that we were being... Almost like ghastly to say it didn't happen. Exactly. Prove it. Exactly. Show know, me. When, when we saw it, we heard it, we, yeah. we, we know people, and then you're telling me nothing happened. Yeah. I should it, prove it. True, very true. You know, I, so, I, I, so, I, I, so that, that for me, because people have died before. People mm -hmm. died in Odi. Yeah. There was a massacre mm -hmm. in yeah. Odi. People died in Zaria. Yeah. People have died in Aba, in Onicha. You know, people have been shot. Peaceful people have been shot. So it's not a new thing. But this is the first time that they that denied it ever happened. Yeah, and accusing people who say it happened and, and arresting them for saying it happened. Yeah, yeah that's, that's the one that just, I just like, no. So mm -hmm. in the days of military, we didn't even have it this no. bad. Yeah. I, I, I think the two advocates, Emeka and, and Liberos, um, have, have some similar. things in, in common. And my, my, uh, I, I would still lean towards that increased participation in the electoral process. 
Now, the, the younger generation, whatever that means, are saying, oh, we have uh, a better way to do this. We have new ideas, new agenda. The only way that we know in modern time is still via that electoral process. Registering parties or joining parties, or, it is a way to influence things. We have seen that the streets did not deliver much dividend. It didn't. As a matter of fact, the people in power cowered them mm. into submission. Let's get more involved. Okay. Well, um, well, I agree with you. Like you have said, it's good for us to participate more. And so that's why the advocate is better with your participation. It's time to share some of your views on issues discussed here. Responding to the advocacy on who the Nigerian Senate is representing, Ola for Good says, I keep telling people about the eight Senates that they are the best set of senators in the history of the country. But the nine Senates are just too busy to caring for themselves only, not the country or the nation. And then responding to the advocacy on Chinese recognizing Nigeria, the Honey 75 says, we need people with good heads and selflessness in power before things get ugly. And besides, US and the rest of the West are as bad as China. Um, I, I might agree with you also. That's why you need to protect yours. You know, and nobody will come and protect and, and protect yours if you can't protect it. Follow us on our social media platform on Facebook, Plus TV Africa, hashtag the Advocate NG, or on Twitter and Instagram at Plus TV Africa. Always remember hashtag the Advocate NG. And to catch up with previous broadcasts, simply go to plustvafrica.com for slash the Advocate NG. And after the break, Chuka is speaking on a new Nigeria. Stay with us. Five panelists, five topical issues, no holds barred. For me, it's not knowledge that's lacking. It's that greed, it's that mentality where you feel you deserve to take your own and take it infinitely and let everybody else just manage however they will manage. We're almost becoming hardwired to try and cheat. I would, you know, suggest that we begin to hold our leaders accountable. There was a time in this country when yes. things actually work. I don't think that any organization should be above the law. And I think one of the challenges we have in this country is about governance across the board. Well, well, what I'm saying is that it doesn't really affect us in Nigeria. That's I don't know what we can do if the system is already corrupted. We've been warned as a continent of the influx of the Chinese. If you don't repay your debt, they will just colonize you. So today, I'll be talking about a new Nigeria. It's late in the day for General Buhari to make suitable impact in the development trajectory of Nigeria. Six years of his regime has come to not much good for us. So by 2023, nothing would have changed for the good. Promises of a corrupt-free government of national security have come to nothing. Education, health, infrastructure, all stagnant. Human rights is virtually non-existent. And dare I say, even common sense does not prevail in governance. And I mean, the utterances of Lai Mohammed give credence to this. So what do we do now as a nation? The obvious task ahead of us is strengthening our institutions to deal with our errant behavior. At the moment, it's all just a tea party. So a reconfiguration of thought processes will do a lot to help us achieve this. We underestimate Western education. We brag about so-called successful lives achieved without requisite education. But this success is all mediocrity. And what we do is wallow in mediocrity and run a false economy that has no indices for true measurement of growth and productivity. And as soon as we are done with our mediocrity, we hurry off to the West to enjoy a bit of real good life. I'd like Nigerians to collectively condemn all past and then even the present governments. Stop the unintelligent debates about good luck Jonathan or Basinger or Gawan being better than others. Stop deifying ex-governors just because they built ramshackle schools and clinics. The stories behind their own stories will shock you. Let's judge people properly or you will get governors who have unexplained killings behind them wanting to run for president. Let's stop defending people because they belong to the same tribe. You want an ex-governor whose bank accepted to launder $280 million for a past president 
to run for your presidency because you are of the same tribe. We are all institutions. So are the corporations and arms of government. So please condemn an information minister who proposes to borrow and spend $500 million on the Nigeria Television Authority. It is daylight robbery in disguise. Do your own work with honesty. Promote high standards within your profession. Society needs you. They do not need you prefixing absurd professions before your name, barrister, architect, and all that. They need your brains. And believe me, when you begin to see things for what they are, you'll join me on the way to a progressive nation. Embrace progress, build ranches. Mechanize farming, be methodical with it. Learn to be entrepreneurial, even if you made large sums of money from graft. <laughs> Fantastic. It's a beautiful piece. Brief, straight to yeah. the point and concise. But, um... Embrace, embrace ranching. <laughs> embrace mechanized farming. No, but you, you know... The... Nobody needs your barrista, architect, architect engineer. They need your brain. Awesome. There are so few... There are uh, pharmacists. Uh, Broadcaster. It is, it, is when, <laughs> it is when you know next to nothing, nothing. that you it. want that preface. You want people to recognize you with it, not what you have in your, what hey. you have upstairs. Hmm. And so, oh, let them know that I'm a barrister. Let them know that I'm a doctor. <laughs> but meanwhile, when it comes to doing the job, you are stuttering. True, very true. Second base, um, I, I, I hope that we all take the lessons from Chuka's advocacy, although it's not the first time that we're hearing it. Um, when it is my brother that is the next in line to mm -hmm. become governor and the political party chooses him, <laughs> yeah, I may just forget yeah. Chuka's mm -hmm. advocacy. But well, that is how it works. <laughs> I, I mean, I, mean I, I have real life examples of yeah. a friend whose brother became a senate. And this was someone who has been mm. agitating for transparency in the salaries of this National Assembly people. All of a sudden, he went quiet and believed that after his own brother's session... What's that Kenyan writer that says, um, when there's food, she'll uh, not be talking when there's food. Don't talk where you're eating. You know, but really, uh, but really um, Senator Eina uh, Baribe is a friend. Mm -hmm. But he keeps telling me, liberals keep criticizing us. Mm. Criticize us if even if I don't do anything good, I want to hear you someday criticize me. Mm. You, you know, mm. so it, it makes people you, you put them on their toes, yes, yeah. because as a leader, you're in the public eye. True. I, I also I like the fact that you know, Chuka is talking about look, we need to work together. Let's we, in your own little mm. space try to be different, and that's the only way when you get to public space, you would you know also want to do it differently. Mm. You won't listen to imagine. Oshomole, as a governor, you look at the house, the massive house he built in this village. Just before the program, we were talking about your children going to school, and before you know it, they've left you. They are you are alone empty. in that big house. And then your wife is busy chasing Omugwa here and there, you know, grandchildren, and then the house is empty. And that house you built with two billion naira, it's all of a sudden, that will you need hundred no. million to maintain, maintain it. the house. And so, but you ask yourself, if you had spent that two billion. To build, to build a school. Low cost housing or to finance small uh, industries, cottage industries. And that's your and community. That's your community. And live in that small house, you will have more people to provide security for you. It just reminds okay. me of our Oba who had two, two million dollars in his I house think, in the middle of poverty. I think uh, that your Oba is there. I think that. <laughs> there's, there's, a, there's a sense. There's a sense, um, even if I talk, I, as I spoke about hope and giving up hope, and there's a sense that uh, Chuka's advocacy and, and getting into the spirit where, even for those of us who are older and we, are, you know, we've reached a certain level, that younger people must be fed with hope. Younger people must be given a line, mm -hmm. um, you know, to see a path. And I who, think that 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 may be what's the ch challenge. Who is, who is to feed them? Because I know, for instance, that our religious homes used to give us hope. But again, they use that to Which indoctrinate hope? us Which hope? For, Which hope? for their own gains. Which hope religious? Uh, <laughs> they, they, they are looking <laughs> for. They, they, can, they hold you. That's a topic for another day. They hold you <laughs> in captivity uh, to consistently fleece you. No, you're, hope, you're no actually hope. I a... bought my fourth jet in yes, COVID. In COVID. <laughs> yeah, can you well, um, since we're an era of uh, hope, leadership, and um, you know, Messiah. 
Just stay with us after the break. Jumoke is actually seeking for a Nigerian's next messiah. Don't go anywhere. I posted a campaign video from 2015 on Twitter on Tuesday where the actors complained about their neighbor's children being kidnapped and the kidnappers had written them that they were next in line. The campaign was to vote President Buhari rather than President Jonathan, who, as Commander-in-Chief, had claimed he no longer knew what to do. People remembered that video and claimed they were scammed by the campaign, as insecurity and kidnappings are now daily. So this government, they owe you change. But you still voted for next level now. Abi, you are one of those who claim the election was rigged. The Supreme Court doesn't agree with you. Who is Nigeria's next messiah? I'm a member of a few political groups, not because I have any interest in joining politics, but because of my passion for good governance in Nigeria. So I constantly hear people ask me to come and do it better. I tell them, I criticize not because I can't do it better. I just hold the people who promise to, to their words. That's the job of a journalist anyway to hold the executive, legislature, and judiciary accountable. That's why we're the fourth estate of the realm in any democracy. I don't take the job of governance for granted. It must be difficult to lead a diverse group who want different things. But in a population of over 200 million, Nigerians can give more people the chance to try, especially people who vouch to have the answers, than perpetrate failures in government. This is my strong belief. We ought to keep voting our failures and never allow them back. We keep recycling the same old rulers, like they will suddenly have answers they didn't have years ago. Someone that didn't do anything to develop themselves in the years they've been out of government, yet you expect them to come back and turn Nigeria to El Dorado? Nigerians are the ones expecting a Messiah instead of coming together to create systems agree on a working constitution and stand by it regardless of political affiliations. Any human being can become a tyrant if the system allows. No one is perfect. But here we have institutions that allow a commander in chief to disobey our constitution and everyone says, yes sir. People are loyal to the president rather than to the constitution. So I get into government appoint all my friends, competent or not, and even create a new ministry for my mother. Opposition wills. Then they get into power and do even worse. She Nigeria with the lazy dance by. Isn't Nigeria collapsing? The current constitution was like a military decree passed down just the way the northern and southern protectorates were forcefully amalgamated in 1914. The 2014 conference was the opportunity we had to break it all down and reconstitute. But again, we allowed politics dictate the deliberations at the national conference. We can't keep doing the same thing and expect different results. Even if the best Nigerian becomes president in 2023, the system may still corrupt them. When are we all going to say enough is enough? Or are we waiting for a messiah from the South in 2023? No, but I thought you wanted to point us to a, to a messiah. Nigerians <laughs> <laughs> are always mm -hmm. expecting a messiah. Oh, oh, um, but I, I, I agree. Like I said also in my advocacy, you know, we want a messiah, but we will do everything to undermine the process that will lead to us, you know, um, getting that Correct. messiah. I, I, and that's why I also, this is instructive, uh, Chuka's advocacy now saying, look, Whatever you are, be the best of that thing. It yeah. is those individual efforts that will bring us together and help us to understand. Because that end SARS protest would not have been defeated if the government did not know that there's a pool of some uneducated people that they can use True. to fight the educated ones. And but so, it's not yet, so. If, we, if we keep, you know, the educated ones, keep advocating for and on behalf of the uneducated ones, and find a way to educate them and bridge that gap. Very soon, these people you call leaders will run away from Nigeria. Um, may I ask a question, though, um, Emeka? Because why would the security man keep on saying, Madam, anything for us? 
you know, and the I'm drive. I'm supposed to talk on this advocacy. <laughs> I'm asking a question. <laughs> I'm, I'm throwing it open in terms of how does Nigeria get better with the culture of entitlement and getting everything beggy, that beggy. I can. Yes. I, I think it's it's a it's a symptom or is a, a collapse of a system um, where you know um, there's no trust in authority, there's no trust in the system, um, there's no dependency. So the only mm -hmm. thing that's left to everyone is to feed off oh, one that's... another. Yeah, true. So either, either by force, so if I can take it, I'll take it. If I can con you and take it with why you're 419 or whatever, I'll take it. Yeah. Um, or I beg you for it. We used to have this joke that the best way to, when you meet a policeman on the road, you know, growing up in the barracks, there was this tendency that you either, you know, those when we were much younger, we pull rank. Mm -hmm. We're like, do you, you know, you know, you know who I am. You know, we speak in a certain military lingo. And, and it guy, works. And it works. Or if you're cut out, you beg the policeman. There are two ways. So you don't use force to say, you know, who, who are you talking to? And then, you know, use chance him. Or when you get there, he stops you. You say, ah, oh, Ghana, we, we now. You know, because <laughs> that is, so there's no, and if you, if you look at that, there's no dependency in a system that functions, yeah. you know, legitimately and... and no social and, safety yeah. net. So you see that. So you have to find a way. And that's really what's happening. So whether yeah. you see them at the airports and, you know, I don't know, you saw that thing where the Zambians, uh, the yeah. Ugandans were making a jest of us yeah. uh, a few weeks ago. How come into Nigeria? Everybody's begging from the airport. Yes. <laughs> Everybody's begging. Okay, welcome. What's in your brain? Yeah. Uh, Chuka, it's, Chuka it's, so, sorry, quickly, Chuka. I wanted to find out if... Uh, yeah, the, in the Queen's country, the, is that the, the way they the, bury the airport too? Well, I don't know how we're going to... This Messiah matter is a very serious question. Um, <laughs> I, I, it ties in again with even what I was saying about glorifying the wrong people and not accepting to judge people. We have to judge people. Let nobody deceive you about oh, yeah. what the and Bible says or does not say. We have to judge people properly. And if we know a man to have done something very bad, let's not bring him forward for spare. governor, president, senator, whatever. One governor became a governor through killings. I'm not saying he killed anybody, but there was ruthless killing going on before he could become a governor that perhaps was even raped. Today, what is he doing? He's putting up posters to be president. Mm. Yes. He and denies that there's COVID. I mean, as far as I'm concerned, Nigerians will in the end vote for this man. And you'll be no. shocked. No. No. Not, 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 in, not in 2023. Is he, I said he wants to be the in chief. There, 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 <laughs> there, there are some a rather simplistic uh, uh, approach I, I like to pull down on this. And it involves numbers. In 2019 presidential election, where you have the total number of votes by PDP and APC being 26 million. million. Meanwhile, the number of people between ages of 18 and 39 are about 60 million people. If you take Lagos, there were over 6 million registered voters, only 1 million plus votes. Where, what were the 5 million other voters doing? On election day. I can answer that question. Looking yes, for you. food, though. I can answer that question for you because I was part of that process. You remember when mm. Jega came? Jega said the electoral register was largely flawed, and so they needed to clean it up. And so they, what they did was they introduced biometrics for the first Correct. time. Correct. Yeah. And you know, after the biometric, a lot of people did multiple registration. And so they introduced automated fingerprint identification system. And so this automated fingerprint identification system will match your biometrics mm -hmm. with your facials and your name. So the moment they did that, the, the, the numbers dropped drastically. Yeah, that and is then, wait, the, now, the now, let me, no, wait, let me That is tell where you are comparing the let registers now, no, of previous wait, year no, no. with 2019. This, no, the current one, let mm. me tell you what happened. The moment they, that is because it's the same Jagas register that they are still using. So when the numbers dropped, all the governors started complaining. No, 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 you have to leave it as it is because it is the numbers that they used to rig. And that's why when vote counts and you use biometric, journalists will tell you there was large turnout of voters. But at the end of the day, the actual number of voters, when you put it together, is less than a million. What it means is that our voting strength and our numbers are overrated. Go and check it.
it, it, you see, comparing previous years' voters' register. No, I'm talking about this current so, voters' the, register. The, the current register was based on biometrics. This is, that is the biometric I'm telling exactly. you. Exactly. So after you have the biometric says, there. after the biometric says you have five we million shared, or six we million shared voters, voters card. why we, were people not not coming? Do out you know vote? how many voters' cards are still with? Are we saying in a, in a city I mean, of twenty million people, let's not even, it's only one million valid voters that live there? Let's not yeah, argue about numbers. It's not possible. Let's argue. I think what I take from 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 Golan's point is is the fact that there's a there's a sea change that's about to occur with more people who did not vote before, did not participate, coming out to participate. I think that's the point you were trying to make. Well, and, and can we hold their hands in 2023 and, and, and drag them to the Drag pool. them there and ensure that they are not voting because based on 2,000 naira for bread or one Mr. Egungun that promised exactly. that he will give them 35% uh, women <laughs> agenda. Yeah. I'm just saying. Time is never our friend on this program. However, the advocacy continues on our social media platforms on Facebook, Plus TV Africa. The hashtag is AdvocateNG. Or on Twitter and Instagram at Plus TV Africa, same hashtag, the Advocate NG. To catch up on previous broadcasts, please go to plustvafrica.com forward slash the Advocate NG. Don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel, Plus TV Africa. Till next week, same time. Oh, it's my birthday. So, we are going to launch. <laughs> Till next time, same time on the station. Let's keep advocating for a better society. See you next week. All right. Five panelists, five topical issues, no holds barred. For me, it's not knowledge that's lacking. It's that greed. It's that mentality where you feel you deserve to take your own and take it infinitely and let everybody else just manage however they will manage. We're almost becoming hardwired to try and cheat. I would, you know, suggest that we begin to hold our leaders accountable. There was a time in this country when yes. things actually worked. I don't think that any organization should be above the law. And I think one of the challenges we have in this country is about governance across the board. Well, well, what I'm saying is that it doesn't really affect us in Nigeria. That's I don't know what we can do if the system is already corrupted. We've been warned as a continent of the influx of the Chinese. If you don't repay your debt, they will just colonize you.